Chapter Four of By What Authority by Robert Hugh Benson. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Mary Corbett. The spring that followed the visit to London passed uneventfully at Great Keynes to all outward appearances, and yet for Isabel they were significant months. In spite of herself and of the word of warning from her father, her relations with Hubert continued to draw closer. For one thing, he had been the first to awaken in her the consciousness that she was lovable in herself, and the mirror that first tells that to a soul always has something of the glow of the discovery resting upon it. Then again his deference and his chivalrous air had a strange charm. When Isabel rode out alone with Anthony, she often had to catch the swinging gate as he rode through after opening it and do such little things for herself. But when Hubert was with them, there was nothing of that kind. And, once more, he appealed to her pity. And this was the most subtle element of all. There was no doubt that Hubert's relations with his fiery old father became strained sometimes, and it was extraordinarily sweet to Isabel to be made a confidant. And yet Hubert never went beyond a certain point, his wooing was very skilful, and he seemed to be conscious of her uneasiness almost before she was conscious of it herself, and to relapse in a moment into frank and brotherly relations again. He came in one night after supper, flushed and bright-eyed, and found her alone in the hall, and broke out immediately, striding up and down as she sat and watched him. "'I cannot bear it!' there is mr bailey who has been with us all lent he is always interfering in my affairs and he has no charity i know i am a catholic in that but when he and my father talk against the protestants mistress isabel i cannot bear it they were abusing the queen to-night at least he added for he had no intention to exaggerate they were saying she was a true daughter of her father and sneers of that kind and i am an englishman and her subject and i said so and mr bailey snapped out and you are also a catholic my son and then and then i lost my temper and said that the catholic religion seemed no better than any other for the good it did people and that the rector and mr norris seemed to me as good men as any one and of course i meant him and he knew it, and then he told me, before the servants, that I was speaking against the faith, and then I said, I would sooner speak against the faith than against good Christians, and then he flamed up scarlet, and I saw I had touched him, and then my father got scarlet too, and my mother looked at me, and my father told me to leave the table for an insolent puppy, I, and I knocked over my chair and stamped out, and oh mistress isabel i came straight here and he flung down astride of a chair with his arms on the back and dropped his head on to them it would have been difficult for hubert even if he had been very clever indeed to have made any speech which would have touched isabel more than this there was the subtle suggestion that he had defended the protestants for her sake and there was the open defence of her father and defiance of the priests whom she feared and distrusted. There was a warm generosity and frankness running through it all, and lastly there was the sweet flattering implication that he had come to her to be understood and quieted and comforted. Then, when she tried to show her disapproval of his quick temper, and had succeeded in showing a poorly disguised sympathy instead, he had flung away again, saying that she had brought him to his senses as usual and that he would ask the priest's pardon for his insolence at once. And Isabel was left standing and looking at the fire, and fearing that she was being wooed, and yet not certain, though she loved it. And then, too, there was the secret hope that it might be through her, that he might escape from his superstitions, and... And then... And she closed her eyes and bit her lip for joy and terror, she did not know that a few weeks later hubert had an interview with his father of which she was the occasion 
Lady Maxwell had gone to her husband after a good deal of thought and anxiety, and told him what she feared, asking him to say a word to Hubert. Sir Nicholas had been startled and furious. It was all the lad's conceit, he said. He had no real heart at all. He only flattered his vanity in making love. He had no love for his parents or his faith, and so on. She took his old hand in her own and held it while she spoke. Sweetheart, she said, how old were you when you used to come riding to Overfield? I forget. And there came peace into his angry, puzzled old eyes, and a gleam of humor. Mistress, he said, you have not forgotten for he had been just eighteen, too, and he took her face in his hands delicately and kissed her on the lips. Well, well, he said, it is hard on the boy, but it must not go on. Send him to me. Oh, I will be easy with him. But the interview was not as simple as he hoped, for Hubert was irritable and shamefaced, and spoke lightly of the religion again after all he burst out there are plenty of good men who have left the faith it brings nothing but misery sir nicholas hands began to shake and his fingers to clench themselves but he remembered the lad was in love my son he said you do not know what you say i know well enough said hubert with his foot tapping sharply i say that the catholic religion is a religion of misery and death everywhere look at the low countries sir i cannot speak of that said his father and his son sneered visibly you and i are but laymen but this i know and have a right to say that to threaten me like that is the act of a is not worthy of my son my dear boy he said coming nearer you are angry and god forgive me so am i but i promised your mother and again he broke off and we cannot go on with this now come again this evening hubert stood turned away with his head against the high oak mantelpiece and there was silence father he said at last turning round i ask your pardon sir nicholas stepped nearer his eyes suddenly bright with tears and his mouth twitching and held out his hand which hubert took and i was a coward to speak like that but but i will try went on the boy and i promise to say nothing to her yet at any rate will that do and i will go away for a while the father threw his arms round him. As the summer drew on and began to fill the gardens and meadows with wealth, the little Italian garden to the southwest of the hall was where my lady spent most of the day. Here she would cause chairs to be brought out for Mistress Margaret and herself, and a small selection of devotional books, an orange leather volume powdered all over with pierced hearts, filled with extracts in a clear brown ink, another book called le chapelet de jesus while from her girdle beside her pocket mirror there was always hung an olive-coloured hours of the blessed virgin fastened by a long strip of leather prolonged from the binding here the two old sisters would sit in the shadow of the yew hedge taking it by turns to read and embroider or talking a little now and then in quiet voices with long silences broken only by the hum of insects in the hot air or the quick flight of a bird in the tall trees behind the hedge. Here, too, Isabel often came, also bringing her embroidery, and sat and talked, and watched the wrinkled, tranquil faces of the two old ladies, and envied their peace. Hubert had gone, as he had promised his father, on a long visit, and was not expected home until at least the autumn. "'James will be here to-morrow,' said Lady Maxwell, suddenly, one hot afternoon isabel looked up in surprise he had not been at home for so long but the thought of his coming was very pleasant to her and mary corbett too went on the old lady will be here to-morrow 
or the day after isabel asked who this was she is one of the queen's ladies my dear and a great talker she is very amusing sometimes said mistress margaret